Glad you're here this morning on this muggy day, and I hope the fans help you feel good. Um, we are starting a new series called The Path, and we're going to kind of take a journey over the next four weeks just sort of talking about the path and journey that many of us have been on that has brought us here, but also what is next on our journeys. We're all at different points. Some of us are at a point of deconstruction. Some of us are at a point of reconstruction. Some of us are grieving what we left behind. Some of us are sitting with the rubble of what we don't know and have no idea what we do believe anymore. We're all at different places in our journey. Some of us aren't really sure why we even come to church anymore or if it's actually even a thing we want to do anymore. Um, some of us are all different points on the path and on the journey. And so each week we're going to kind of talk about those different places and hope that, that folks will be able to identify with where they're at um, as well as sort of determine some next steps with uh, moving forward in their, in their journey and the ways that we as a church can sort of support each other in that process. Um, often when I, when I share my story uh, I say that the, only, the first time that I heard about gay-affirming theology was when I was 24 and I was pastoring a church in Kentucky and I came across it on Facebook. But I actually feel like I need to offer a caveat to that story to offer a little bit more truth and a side of the story that I actually have not really shared before. Um, it's a part of the story that I actually think I pushed down and I forgot um, and have recently begun to really think about a part of the story that... Um, I intentionally pressed out of my mind. That was when I was in high school. My best friend, Bridget, uh, who I would often go to proms and homecomings with because I was gay. Um, and she was my only other single friend, and it just worked. It was great. She's, she's now, getting, now just recently got married, and I'm excited for her. But she was sort of my just like anchor when I was in high school. And when I was in high school, her Lutheran pastor um, left, and they hired a new pastor, and he was gay. I remember Bridget telling me that they had hired this new pastor named Keith and that her parents did not agree with this and so they were leaving the church. Now, I also remember Bridget always trying to tell me that it was okay that I was gay. Yes, she knew I was gay. One of the few people that I had shared that with when I was in high school and she kept telling me God loves me, God accepts me just the way I am. I could never hear it because I didn't believe that Luther Bridget was a true Christian because she was a Lutheran. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, of course you believe that. You all aren't Christians. Of course you believe that. And one time she invited me to her church lock-in, and it just totally underscored my belief that they weren't truly Christians because there was pews. I'm like, well, no pew Christian would have a pew. And I was like, this smelled like mildewy water, and they had like these weird felt like, like banners on the side of the wall. I'm like, that is so out of touch with society. They had this organ that just made my ears hurt. Like, it was just not my tradition. It was not my thing. I didn't understand it. And I thought, there's no way these people could be Christians. <laughs> now, her pastor came to that lock-in, and I met him that night. And he striked up a conversation with me several times. And then sometime later, he invited me over to his house to have dinner with him and his husband, lunch with him and his husband. I kind of really thought about it. I was hesitant, and I decided as a good evangelical Christian, I was going to go, and I was going to convert him to the true Christian faith. <laughs> And so I went over, and he had a very nice meal planned for us, and we had a nice and delightful conversation. And he kept basically trying to convince me that he was a Christian every time I was trying to convince him that he wasn't. He explained to me that the only reason that I had my brand of evangelical Christianity today was because his people, the Lutherans, broke off from the Catholics and formed Protestantism. And I just couldn't hear that. I would have none of it. And then he told me something. He said, I take the Bible too seriously to take it literally. And I clutched my pearls and pulled back and said, Satan, get behind me. <laughs> he didn't quite know what to do with any of that. Seemed a little aggressive. And so as we continued to sort of like, like fumble through this connection in this relationship that was really quite messy and toxic, I began to realize I wasn't going to change his mind and he wasn't going to change mine. But yet he was so kind towards me. I was 16-year-old me. It would take almost a decade for that 16-year-old me to be open enough to click Gay Affirming Theology when it popped up on my news feed on Facebook. But the me 10 years prior to that absolutely would have never been open to even touching and clicking that theology. It took me a long journey to finally get there. And now I've changed my mind, I've changed my opinions about many different things. I didn't just change my opinions and my thoughts about sexuality, but first I changed my opinions about God. And then once I changed my opinions and thoughts about God, I changed how God thought about me. 
taken me on a long journey, a hard journey, but my eyes were not open and my ears were not willing to hear at 16 years old. It would take a decade later. I recently went back and I apologized to this pastor for the things that I had said and I had done. Looking back at the last decade of my life, I thought, you know, for 24 years, I believed this so strongly, so deeply. I, I didn't just believe it, but I preached it, and I instilled it into other people through my preaching for a decade. And I thought, I probably need to go back and to have some conversations. And he was one of the people that one day the Holy Spirit put on my mind. Remember that guy that told you that? Remember the things you said to him? You need to go back and apologize. And so I did, and this was his response to me. Just one sentence he said, I understood where you were coming from because I had been there myself. I never knew that. He didn't share that part of his story because I didn't ask any questions and I didn't want to know. I just wanted to know where I wanted him to go and where he was going if he didn't pray my prayer. I was very, very closed off. But I also know that when I look back at my story, I know that many of you probably identify with that. Many of you in this space this morning, you've been there before. You've been in that place, like that pastor said to me, I know, I know what it's like to think that and to now think this. I know what it was like to one, at one time in your life have your mind closed and your ears not willing to hear and your heart hardened, but then for something to shift. And then to look back and to have a lot of emotions and feelings about the time from before. I don't know, maybe you've felt that around your beliefs about believing that unbaptized babies go to purgatory or something. Or maybe that there was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed version of Jesus until you were told to think something different about who Jesus was. Or maybe you were believed at some point that women should be silent in church. Or maybe you were like me at one point who told women that they couldn't be in ministry after they came to me and told me they wanted to be pastors and I said, you can't do that. Or maybe you sat in premarital counseling sessions like me and told people who were getting married who had already had sex before marriage, you'll never have as fulfilling of a marriage because you've already ruined it before you started. These are things I said that now I look at and I'm like, whoa. The pain, the damage, and every so often the Holy Spirit will bring someone up in my mind or on my Facebook feed and will remind me the things I said to that person. And will say, maybe it's time to reach out. Maybe it's time to reach out and let them know that you don't think the things you said anymore. Maybe you've been there before. Maybe you know what that's like. I'm curious this morning, I'm curious what you carry into this space, what your stories are. I'm curious where you find yourself on your journey. The Apostle Paul, I think, found himself in similar places that I and many of you find yourself. Before he was named the Apostle Paul, he was named Saul. And he had such a dramatic change in his life that they changed his name to a different name, a new beginning, a new place. Some facts about the Apostle Saul that Apostle Paul, also known as Saul that you might not know, is that 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament are attributed to him. But only seven are really accepted as being entirely offered by Paul. Now you may be like, what? What do you mean? There's a lot of debate around which letters Paul actually wrote and which ones he didn't. This is why there's certain writings in Scripture where Paul literally signs it and says, I write this with my own hand because he started signing his signature at the bottom of the letters that were being dictated from him. Because for many of the letters that, that, are, that we, we've gotten from Paul, almost half of them, it is believed that other people wrote those letters after Paul passed to speak as his voice or to make the early church and certain churches think this was a letter from Paul to stir dissension and division amongst the churches because they took Paul's word as gospel. And so there's a lot of debate around which ones were actually written by Paul, which one were not, which is why sometimes you see that Paul says some contradictory things, like there is no difference between male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, but then in other books he says women should, should be quiet in the church and cover their heads. Some think that maybe that's a progression in Paul changing his opinions over time as he was growing and he changed his opinions on many things throughout Scripture. Others believe that those are just books that were not written by him versus books that were written by him. So there's a lot of debate about these things within the early church as well as through history of historians and critical readers of these texts. Many reasons there are Jews. He was also a Greek-speaking Jew and he was a Pharisee. What made the difference between Pharisees and Sadducees? Well, um, basically Pharisees believed in the afterlife whereas Sadducees did not believe in the afterlife. And also Pharisees versus Sadducees Pharisees believed in non-biblical traditions where Sadducees believed that we should only follow things that were in the traditions of the Torah. 
but Pharisees believe, oh, there's a lot of traditions that aren't in there that we should follow and hold as valuable. So this is sort of some differences to give you some context about what uh, Saul is bringing to his change, to his journey, to his process. Paul also thought it was his duty to keep the Jewish faith and the synagogue doctrines pure. Many of you know or have experienced that, perhaps in certain churches where you were kicked out of or told you weren't going to belong or you couldn't be on certain committees or teams because it was their job to keep the purity of the doctrine of the church and you'd stepped out of place. And maybe they pushed you out of place. Sound familiar to you? I know many of us have experienced that, whether that was from divorce or whether that was because you had sex before marriage or you were living with someone you weren't married to and all of a sudden you were disqualified. Pushed to the edges, told you, weren't, you, were, you didn't belong. This is Paul. Paul would have been the major enforcer of this, making sure everybody stayed in their place. And as Jews started to convert to Christianity or do a new version of Judaism as it would have been understood at the time, the, the way, Paul believed he needed to put an end to that to keep things as pure as he could within Judaism. So let's, with all of that in mind, let's pick up Paul's journey and story in Acts chapter 9 as he begins reading in verse 3. It says, As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, his mission to put Christians in their place, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice responded, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and I'll tell you what you must do. A few weeks ago, uh, Evan and Noel and Alyssa all had this beautiful song that they shared with us. Remember that? I'm sorry no one ever explained Jesus to you was the words of the lyrics in the song. If you didn't hear it, feel free to search it on Google, Explaining Jesus by Jordy Searcy. It's a beautiful song about times when folks are introduced to Jesus in a way that actually causes them more harm than good. And then he goes on to say, but I'm so sorry that no one ever truly explained Jesus to you who Jesus truly is. And I, I kind of think about that song when I think about this journey that all of a sudden he's encountering Jesus on this, on, on this road to Damascus. And I kind of hear Jesus appearing and saying, listen, I'm so sorry that no one ever explained God to you. I'm so sorry that when you hear about me, Jesus in the flesh, incarnate, that, that you cannot put that together with the God that you know. But here I am to tell you today. Here I am to tell you today who Jesus is, who God is, when God, if God was to come in the flesh. After all this has been said in verse 7, the men with, with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Verse 8, Saul picked himself up off of the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. As we read the story of Saul on this journey, I invite us to consider our own paths that have led us here to forefront today. What light has knocked you on your ass? On your journey? What light found you at a place where you just found yourself on the ground, blind, confused, disillusioned, unsure of what's next, unsure of what was, and unsure of what will be? That's exactly where Saul found himself in this story today. Disillusioned and confused. What beliefs or people or groups or traditions or interpretations of Scripture were you, like Saul, at one point blind to, unwilling to see, or like me, unwilling to listen to a gay preacher? Not because he was gay most, but because he was a Lutheran. <laughs> what light shined into your heart and softened you? What kicked you off of your horse into the ground? What perhaps still has you on the ground? What perhaps still has you blind, unsure, wandering, trembling and afraid to get up? What's blurred your vision? Verse 8 says, So his companions led him by hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days. He did not eat or drink. I find that fascinating. Three days of blindness and he doesn't eat or drink. And I, and I wonder why he doesn't eat or drink. Is he grieving? I know so many people that as they grieve, their appetite is gone. Their will for living and for life is just stopped. They are just sitting in the pain and the sorrow and they almost have to be forced to eat to move on because their body is literally shutting down from sorrow and sadness. I wonder if he sat in the grief of realizing that he had, he had flogged and he had killed and he had jailed Christians. But yet now 
he looks back and he realizes all the pain and sorrow he has caused. He, he realizes his whole life has been dedicated to following the law and following God in a very particular way of the traditions of his ancestors. And now all of a sudden what he's been taught all of his life, maybe it's not quite what he thought it was. And he doesn't know what to Maybe he is sick to his stomach. I remember this stage in my journey well. And my grandmother often reminds me of this stage in my journey. After I came out and lost everything, I went to her house for three months. I stayed in her basement, and every morning and every day, I had nothing to do because I had no job, I had very few friends, and I didn't know what was next for me. And my grandma reminds me of this, that there would be almost every day for three months, she said, I would walk the backyard in circles. And she could look out her back window and she'd see me crying and talking and singing. And the song that I would sing on repeat in that season is a song I sang in my sermon a few weeks ago. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch or saint like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. I would sing that song because of those last two stanzas. That I was blind, but now I see. And I carried so much grief of what was and what would be. But I knew that God would carry me through that. I just didn't know how. I didn't know what was next. And I imagined Saul as he sat with his pain, with his deconstruction, with his discouragement, with his disorientation, with his depression. I bet he also did not know what was next on the journey. He did not know what would be, and as well he grieved what used to be. Perhaps he held the same shame that I did over the things and the people that I had taught. God, but God, the story isn't over. As he's grieving and as he is disoriented, as he is blind and as he is starving to death because he hasn't eaten in three days, God is preparing someone to come to him in just the nick of time. Verse 10, it says, Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. Say Ananias. Ananias. It's a name you should know. It's not a popular name. He didn't write any books in the Bible. Didn't do anything incredible. No one has a t-shirt or other underwear embroidered with it. No one has any of that. But Ananias is the key to the story because he gave Paul hope to get back up. To carry on God's call. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him called, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. Proper response when God calls for you. The Lord said, go over straight to the house of Judas. I'm curious about that. The house of Judas. Tell me more. I want to know more about that. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. (laughs) Ananias says, but Lord, classic response to anything God says to do, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. He's literally authorized the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, but God, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people of Israel. And so what does Ananias do in verse 17? It says he went and he found Saul. Good idea. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterwards, he ate some food and regained his strength. Honestly, I don't know if he was truly blind and if there was, I mean, literal, a literal scales falling from his eyes. Uh, We realize and we know that stories throughout biblical history are often told with this sort of alliteration and illustration in order to stick in the minds and hearts of people because it was often passed down through oral tradition, not always through written tradition. I don't know. For me, I have no problem with the mysterious and the miraculous, so I'm totally fine with all of that. God speaking and weird voices and scales falling from eyes. But if you're not, that's okay. That's not the only way to subscribe and understand this, nor is this the only way that this has always been understood. 
But what's beautiful to me about this story is I think the whole reason they tell the story, which is this beauty that what Saul once could not see, Saul can now see. How amazing that literally and figuratively and spiritually we have this sort of moment where Saul's eyes are literally opened up to see God, to see Jesus, to see himself, to see others, to see the world, to see the beliefs, to see the traditions, to see the interpretations of scripture that he was taught, totally different. And never can he unsee it again. And it forever changes his life. For some of us this morning, we know what that was like. We know what it was like to have our eyes open to see something in a new way that we never have before. And we know how disorienting that it can be. How confusing it can be. But it's also an invitation to something truly miraculous and beautiful if we allow it to be. The worst thing, I think, sometimes about being deconstructed and in this sort of limbo stage is the uncertainty of what's ahead. But I invite us this morning to think that the Spirit calls us to return to the places and spaces, I think, sometimes that are unfamiliar to us. So some of you in the room this morning, maybe you're where Saul is. Just kind of check in with yourself. Are you, are you in those early stages of like hearing new thoughts of new beliefs and ideas that you haven't thought of before? Are you dealing with that sort of like depressive disillusionment from family and friends or other connections and traditions that you knew? Is that where you are? Or, or maybe you're even a little bit further along in that. Maybe you, it's not new to you, but you know a lot about what you don't believe, but you have no clue what you do believe. And you just sort of feel disillusioned. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe you feel blind and your sight's just starting to return. Maybe the scales are just falling off. Maybe you're still on the ground. Maybe you're still waiting for your Ananias to come. Or maybe you're not there. Maybe you are where Ananias is. Maybe you're the Ananias in the room. Maybe you've done a lot of deconstruction work. You've figured some things out. You've seen Jesus in a way that you never have before. I mean, Ananias also was a Jew at one point who came to see Jesus and God in a new way, and his life was on the line for it. And he was listening to the whispers of the Spirit and responding to go, just like that Lutheran pastor responded and was my Ananias as a 16-year-old. I wasn't ready to receive it, but it was preparing my heart for a decade later. Sometimes God's going to call those of us who are the Ananiases to sit across the table with somebody that we'd rather not, that views and sees the world differently than us. Sometimes God is going to call us to have conversations and to go back to places and spaces that are scary and unfamiliar as it was for Ananias to go back to the Apostle Paul after the stories he had heard. I don't want to say that we're all different points in our journey and so some of us were fragile and it's not time and we're not ready to go back to those places and those spaces and those conversations. But I believe that there is a time when we will be as prepared as Ananias was. That when the Spirit comes and says, go and have that conversation with that person whose eyes are closed and they can't see me the way you see me. Go and let them know who I am. Go and explain Jesus to them. Open the eyes of the blind. Set the captives free. As Jesus called us to. Perhaps it was never a literal sense. Perhaps it was always figurative. For not all that are blind actually want to see. Both literally and figuratively. I don't think that God ever thought blind people were somehow bad or broken or something was wrong with them. I think that God made them that way. And that's not a problem. Perhaps it is a gift. Just as blindness for those who are born blind know nothing else other than blindness, that also is true for us who have sight. It would be as if someone came to you and said, would you like to be blind? No, this is all I know. And perhaps sometimes when we ask those who are blind if they want to be healed, they'd say, no, I don't even know what you're talking about. This is what I know and this is my lived reality. I don't think blindness is the thing to dismiss. Jesus often asks the blind if they want to even see or he be healed. I think the question in all of this is, are we blind to the spiritual things around us? Are we blind to see Jesus the way Jesus truly presents Jesus' self, or the way that Jesus presents who God is amidst our misconceptions of it? Perhaps we're being invited into that. 
It will take courage to have these conversations for those of us in the room who feel the call of Ananias, who feel the whispers of the Spirit. It will take faith, but without a doubt is a necessary part of the work of spreading the next 500 years of Christianity. A progressive vision and view of who God is. Setting the captives free, opening the eyes of the blind, and setting the oppressed free. I am grateful for a Lutheran gay pastor who took that call seriously, who knew what it was like to be a 16-year-old me and went back to the trenches to let me know that I could be set free of my oppression. Philip Yancey says, the worst thing to do when you deconstruct is to destruct. And for many of us, when we deconstruct our faith and we don't do the work to put it back together, that is precisely what we're doing. The faith will not look the same way it used to. But let us not destruct it amidst the deconstruction. Let us put back something together that's even more beautiful. As we close this morning's message, I want to ur urge you with this final story by Harriet Tubman. Often when she was helping those esla escape slavery, there would come a point on the journey in the Underground Railroad when people would begin to be just, just totally drenched in fear of the uncertainty of what lied ahead. And to not know what good life was on the other side of this. And it would just come over them. And they would freak out and they would decide, never mind, never mind, I'm going to go back. I'm going to return. I'm, I'm going to turn back around. This isn't worth it. And amidst the uncertainty, amidst the fear, Harriet would often stop and she would begin to hold them in her arms and cradle them and sing to them. As she heard the 11 voices behind her blending softly with hers, she would feel the calm and the nerves of the journey ahead of the human that she held in her arms, so close to freedom, but yet so afraid of the journey to get there. She said there were even times when they would get so upset, she would, she'd have to tell them a story to get them to laugh, to break their anxiety for a moment, or, or even this, a step further, pull a gun on them <laughs> and hold them hostage until she knew that their panic attack would come down. And then after their panic attack had come down, she would say these words to them. You are completely forgiven. Now let's take this journey together. She pulled a gun on them and didn't let them go back. One, because she knew that if they would just let this moment pass and they could just get to the other side where she had been, that they would never want to go back. But she also knew if she let them go back to where their oppressors were, that they would surely, in their anxiety and fear, perhaps give the rest of them up and it would put an end to the freedom that would come for many to come. I want to encourage us this morning in this. No matter how you freaked out along the journey or no matter what turns or uh, overturns that you've had, no matter how many times you've messed up or figured it out or gone to church and been back to church or deconstructed or reconstructed or tried to figure it all out, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. And God was with you along the whole journey. Even if you didn't see it or hear it, now let's do this journey together, church. Let us be the Saul's whose eyes are open and let us be the Ananias's who go to those eyes who are closed and open them again that we may explain Jesus to them, that they may know the Jesus that sets all people free. Amen and amen.